Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. This is the first schoolhouse lecture presentation of the 2005 season. Um, we will hopefully put on two or three more before 2005 is out. Uh, as you may or may not know, the Schoolhouse Lecture Series is a collaboration between the Cleveland Heights Historical Society and the Landmark Commission of the City of Cleveland Heights. The Cleveland Heights Historical Society is a somewhat virtual organization whose mission uh, is kind of obvious. It's to uh, research and promote the very rich and extensive history that we all enjoy. Um, living in Cleveland Heights or visiting occasionally for those of us who don't live here. Um, towards that end, I'd like to point your attention to the table over there, which contains a variety of the Cleveland Heights Historical Society newsletters, which you're welcome to pick up. Um, somewhere in the newsletters, as well as uh, separate on the table, are membership applications for the city, for the uh, Cleveland Heights Historical Society. And I would certainly encourage and welcome anyone who would like to become a member of the society to consider joining for a mere $15. We will happily send the newsletter more or less quarterly to your homes. A $99.99 value, <laughs> marked down to only $15 per year. In any event, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Historical Society is, um, works relatively hard, depending on how much time our members have, on promoting and uh, researching the history of the Cleveland Heights. Its collaborator, the Landmark Commission of the City of Cleveland Heights, is somewhat self-evidently devoted to uh, researching and landmarking homes within the Cleveland Heights area that have either historical or architectural significance. And to this date, the Landmark Commission has, I believe, landmarked just close to 50 homes. And you can find information about the Landmark Commission on the City of Cleveland Heights' website. So with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Kara Hamley O'Donnell, who is the City of Cleveland Heights' Historic Preservation Planner, and also the real power behind the Cleveland Heights Landmark Commission. Kara? Thank you all for coming. It's nice to see some familiar faces as well as some faces that we haven't seen here tonight. That's always nice for us to introduce this building to uh, and some new people. If you have a chance after the lecture, you're welcome to go upstairs. There's a slideshow on the computer with some old photographs of Cleveland Heights. Uh, this building was built um, in the, about 1882. This first floor was built 1893, the second floor. And it's called uh, the Superior Schoolhouse, or originally it was called Old Schoolhouse Number 9. Uh, the bathrooms are back in there. You don't have to go out to an outhouse or anything. There are actual bathrooms around the corner. And um, there's an exit there, an exit there, <laughs> an airplane. Um, and I wanted to make a couple announcements uh, before we start. I wanted to, um, for those of you who are Cleveland Heights residents, make you aware of a few things. Um, the city has a cooperative agreement with the Cleveland Restoration Society. And also on the table, Chris was referring to, we have information on the Heritage Home Loan Program, which is a, a renovating your home um, loan program at 3% through the Cleveland Restoration Society. Also, um, they, uh, as part of our agreement with them, will come to your home and offer, give you free preservation advice as well. You want to know what color to paint your home? Give them a call. Um, you want to know any kind of question, they're happy to help you, and uh, this is part of your tax dollars at work, so we hope you'll take advantage of it. Uh, also, uh, the Cleveland Restoration Society is holding a preservation summit on May 14th, and there's information about that on the table over there. That's down in Akron. And, uh, Chris did tell you about the, the newsletters, and there's plenty of copies of them over there. The other thing I want to tell you about, we do try to do these lectures about every month, starting in the spring and going through when the weather gets too terrible that we don't want to drag people out in it. Uh, we have one planned for May 2nd here. Uh, at Cleveland Restoration Society's Michael Fleener is going to talk about modern architecture, architecture from dating from the 20s or 30s up until the 50s and 60s, and a lot of the homes in the Forest Hill neighborhood are prominently focused in that, in that um, lecture. With that said, um, I had a wonderful bio written of Michael, which I've since misplaced. So, um, I first met Michael a couple years ago when he was just starting to do the research on this book, and. Uh, so it was sort of in the process of renovating the home that the book is focused around. Uh, he's had great reviews both locally and nationally of mo many of his books. I think all of his books have gotten great reviews. Uh, the sort of local ones of local interest, um, of course, to those of us in Cleveland Heights, uh, dealing with the things around Cleveland Heights or down the hill at the Cleveland Clinic, I find especially interesting. 
and I, I'll, I'll let Michael tell you a little bit more about himself when he comes up here, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you, Kara. Um, uh, that was a great job, impromptu as it was. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm sort of the perfect guest, I would think, for the Historical Society, because what this book is house um, is really a love song to this suburb of Cleveland Heights and explores the history and um, social history and developmental history and architectural history a little bit. Um, of this place, which I love so much, and um, basically what happened was, uh, I, I, you know, I'm a writer, that's, that's what I do, I write books for a living, that's what I love to do, and I worked hard to be able to do that, and I feel very lucky to be able to do that. When we bought this house, it was so emotional and crazy, uh, ridiculous, uh, that I sort of, I had to write about it. I mean, we were making offers on houses that we couldn't possibly afford. Uh, you know, what is going on here? What is it with houses? Um, why are we getting so emotional about this? Why is this so important? Um, so I just, you know, I had to, I thought, God, I gotta write about this. I have to explore this. Why do I feel the need to live in Cleveland? All my friends in, on, the, on the East Coast say, what are you living in Cleveland for? I say, I love Cleveland. What's the matter with Cleveland? It's my home. It's my home. Um, so I wanted to explore that. Um, I, I had to write about the experience of this. I started as a novel, actually. I wrote 75 pages. Uh, as a novel, um, and my agent read it and said, you know, I can't sell this as a novel, but if you're willing to write this as a memoir uh, of your house, I can sell that. And so I went back to the beginning and started writing over uh, as a memoir, and I'm going to read some of it um, tonight. Uh, house is inseparable from the land that it's on. So part of what I wanted to explore was the land that was on. I was fascinated by construction. I've written mainly about people who work with their hands. I was fascinated the pro about the process of, of renovation and the people who did it, the people who sold the houses, the people who inspected them. Uh, a whole range of personalities and people came through this house and into this little world of the house. And I thought there was a bigger picture here. Um, there was also a, a, a family living there, uh, our family. And I thought this was interesting to watch how a house shapes the life of a family because it's very important. Uh, so, so basically, my, this book, House, is, is um, an attempt to um, make sense of and order these stories that I found. Um, you know, what I call it is uh, uh, a love song to home and to the controversial notion of the suburb in America, to living where you grew up, to the history of this country, and to the most contentious story of all, how we're using place in America. I think we're trashing our places in America, and it's appalling to me. And as we trash them, we can't get them back. They're permanently gone. Uh, so I love what this, uh, this organization does, and I hope there are many organizations throughout the country. But that's sort of, that's, that was what stirred this book. Um, normally, I write about other people. I, don't, I don't, didn't like to write about myself. It made me nervous. But um, here was the material at hand. So I'm going to read a little bit about it and um, uh, from the book uh, to give you an idea of what it's about, some of the subjects to discuss, and, and then um, perhaps have some, uh, some questions afterwards and we can talk about Cleveland Heights or about writing or about anything you want. Um, one of the things that I found was, you know, when we were exploring these houses was, um, you know, how crazy we were for these houses, how, how we loved them. We, we, in fact, we did more, we lusted after these houses. Um, <laughs> And it really, I mean, it really felt like that. It was, it was, it was, it was house lust. Um, true house lust can grow only under specific conditions. It's not something one lives with and manages continually, like diabetes. It lies dormant in its victims, expressing itself as an admiration for certain kinds of domestic architecture, a windy appreciation of fine carpentry, or a certain style of interior design. In order for inert house lust to bloom into the virus characterized by wanton craving, an overmastering desire for an enormous object, a hunger that supersedes all reason, one must be at a specific stage in life, a transition point. This is the catalyst. And my wife and I were at that point. We decided that we were going to be staying in Cleveland. We didn't want to stay in the house where, where we were at. And um, we made an offer that was uh, uh, about $20,000 more than we can afford, 
And when we made that offer, thank God it was bested. Um, we, we just, we lucked out. Um, uh, and someone else bought it. Um, but at that moment, when, when we made the offer, it was as though the, the house lust seed had been uh, 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 fertilized. Suddenly, you know, it was out of control and, and we were finding, and Donna was out, my wife Donna was out looking for houses. We love to look at houses. One of the great things, reasons to be in Cleveland Heights, I think, is to, is to look at these houses um, and preferably look at them through clear lenses. House washing, watching was a pastime here in Cleveland Heights. Spring and summer on foot or two wheels, touring the neighborhoods was a pleasure because of the houses. I'm sure this is true of most suburbs created before the Depression that are still alive. Born during a time when most things were handmade, every house distinct, the materials excellent. The streets curved, the trees now old and tall. Early photographs of Cleveland Heights are not appealing because they show grand houses rising out of a barren landscape. But put in some tall trees and a canopy of leaves and the place becomes warm, inviting, lush, even mysterious. The imagination comes alive. The houses here have been created largely in the first three decades of the century. Spacious Tudors, humble but elegant colonials, Gothic revivals, Italianates, Queen Anne's, Beaux-Arts, quintessential bungalows, prairie, Victor prairie Victorian, virtually every style of residential architecture from those decades was represented here, neighboring one another, along with a few 19th century farmhouses. On a 20 minute bike ride, you might see a sizable swath of residential architectural history. Homes built with materials that were mainly taken for granted when they were used. First growth timber, blocks of quarried sandstone that had been carved. Even the bricks had a patina and warmth that distinguished them. The operative fact was that the structures built that the structures built during or before the 1920s had a textural richness in their details, the mullions, the eaves, the gables, and had an integrity in their materials, none of them, none of which existed anymore. That kind of construction is unlikely to return, but these houses, they enrich the city and the people who live here by their durable presence every day in every season. One of the main pleasures of looking at these houses, and it's something we do without realizing it or being reflective about it, what makes house watching fun is that you imagine yourself living there. They're the ones you adore. Those are the ones you adore. Don and I used to ride through the neighborhoods before we were parents, and I would imagine a life for us in this house and in that one. I worked as an editor at a local magazine, but, the ambitions to be a no but had ambitions to be a novelist, and these houses and in these houses, I was a novelist. And life was sophisticated and grand. I was F. Scott Fitzgerald writing The Great Gatsby. Those rides to look at houses was a satisfying activity on a summer evening or a Sunday afternoon, a bit of healthy dreaming and fresh air. Reviewing a book about the Manhattan Row House, longtime city resident Judith Thurman describes the urban experience of house lust and the imagination which scarcely difference, differs from my own suburban variety. Perhaps the desire is even more powerful in Manhattan, given the age of the city and the do domestic discomfort and inconvenience that all but the wealthy endure in order to live there. I roam the brownstone blocks of lower Manhattan and Brooklyn Heights, writes Thurman, often at dusk, just as the lights came on and before the shades were drawn, peeping into the parlor windows of old houses, inhabited by rich bohemians and lusting for a saffron yellow library with floor to ceiling bookshelves and a sliding ladder. A gilt pier glass with chipped gesso above an East Lake mantle, French doors opening to a little balcony or a cobbled patio. Fashions in and prices of New York real estate are, as one knows, eminently labile, but the habit of yearning for a poetic old house is so ingrained in some of us, me in particular, that I sometimes forget I have one. Yearning for what she already has, she concludes, I know that one should resist the impulse to anthropomorphize, but townhouses have a presence and a civility missing from more monolithic forms of residential real estate, particularly high-rise apartment buildings. Those human qualities are obviously a function of scale, age, and the imprint of hand labor, though perhaps not merely. The mean of old houses, their solidarity, solidarity and defiance as survivors, makes them seem animate. 
A house may guard the mystery of its inner life, but its face invites us to imagine that it has one. When I drove down the street for the first time with Donna to look at this latest house, curved around the bend in the road to behold it, so clearly old, the thrill began. And when I stepped through the vestibule into the main hallway with its paneled walls and high ceilings, the possibility of merging my fantasized life with real life exploded into full-blown house lust. We were drawn to this old house by the very qualities that made it seem animate to us, its age, its hand-wrought details, a poetic house at the turn of the century, built at the turn of the century. Even its scale relative to the street and the houses around it, the space between them, was luxurious. Don and I felt drawn to it by the imagined pleasures of becoming a part of its inner life. There was, this response was completely sentimental and superficial. We both had an extraordinary capacity to imagine a perfect and rich life within a grand turn of the century residence. This one was it. This was the kind of house in an old house from the edge of the Victorian era that we had once imagined ourselves living in as we cycled through the neighborhood. Incredible though the situation was, the house of our dreams was within reach. Here fantasy and reality might merge. It was in terribly bad shape, which was the only reason why we could afford it. Uh, and of course, we uh, assumed not nearly, uh, we had no idea how much it would really cost. And we made all kinds of uh, very, very serious discussions we had about what we really needed to do and how much it would really cost. Uh, basically a fantasy, just a, a complete fantasy. What were we doing? You know, where were we coming up with these figures? It was ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. But we did it anyway and we made it work. Um, you have to. But anyway, it got me thinking about why, you know, made me think about, you know, what the, what the heck are we doing? And why are we doing this? What does a house mean? We are a country of itinerants in love with the idea of home. The truth and sentimentality of it intertwining so tightly they're almost indistinguishable from one another. What did house and home mean anymore to us generally in this country? Is a yearning for home some prehistoric vestige? One that initially created tight communities for efficient food gathering and mutual, sa mutual safety? Something we're born with that we no longer require? Why do we idealize it? Why do we do it? Long for a home of our own. Yearn to make it. What is the source of and reason for this longing, which runs counter to the American spirit and myth? America's about renewal and reinvention, the open road, flight, and yet our true longing might be for permanent home, a hunger for more primitive and deeply a hunger more primitive and deeply rooted than the American wanderlust imperative. These opposing thrusts make us a confused culture on some levels, and I wondered were we depleting ourselves by moving around so often? by raising our families in a series of changing homes and unconnected places. And what of the house itself, the lives of the people and families, weave themselves into the very architecture? How does the structure of a house shape the life of a family? And what is the place of a house in the evolution of a marriage, a cultural construct I'd always denigrated, but now cherished more than I'd imagined possible? I'd found my perfect lifelong companion and had the good sense to know what that meant. Did any of this have to do with why Donna and I had stretched ourselves to buy this thing? What exactly did a house mean? How and why did a house compel us to act this way? For me and Donna, the specific house meant we'd be vagabonds no longer. Part of our rationale for this questionable impulse was that we intended to stay, to do the majority of our work here, and watch our kids' transformation from this spot, from within this brick behemoth, behemoth with the funky karma. It was an old one with character, with soul, as they say, on a street lined with gorgeous old homes built on either side of World War I, but well before the Depression, after which time decent house construction took a permanent nosedive. We had looked only at old houses in old neighborhoods. The new houses and the new developments way outside the city felt cold and without character to us, disconnected from any kind of community at all. The only center out there was the highway access ramp, and more than our simply connecting with the community was the possibility of being grounded in time. This might be a part of why we found new houses soulless, as it were. They had yet to develop a past and so felt less substantial. When we moved into a grand structure, as we were about to do, we might, 
might we connect with what came before us in that space, we would inevitably become part of the legacy of the house, and by extension, a legacy of the land in which the house was anchored, and of the community sharing that land. The house we bought was a structure we wouldn't tire of, a large brick box with shingles covering the triangles of all four gables. Two main side gables, as well as a gabled bay in front and a narrow gable in back, extending out of the rear corner of the house. A deep front porch anchored the left side of the house, huge blocks of sandstone, sandstone around its foundation, carved sandstone lintels, and sills at all windows. Its designs and details and natural materials could forever engage the eyes as it supported the lives within it on a street worth staying on. The structure itself shapes your life, shapes a family and a marriage, its intellect and spirit, doesn't it? Worth the gamble, anyway. We wanted this house. Moreover, I sensed there was something important to be learned from returning to the city where I'd been born and raised, to live and raise a family of my own here. It was something fewer and fewer Americans did anymore, live in the place where they grew up. In 1987, I returned to live with my father in my childhood home shortly before my 24th birthday, toxic from 18 months in Manhattan where I'd been a copy boy in the newsroom of the New York Times. A few of the ground floor windows of my father's house didn't lock, so in order to sleep, I lined the tops of these windows with delicate glassware. That I would need to do such a thing was less a reflection of the comfortable white-collar middle-class neighborhood in Shaker Heights, Ohio, than of the lingering impact of the place I'd left. I'd found a, a man in my closet one time. It's not a pleasant experience. <laughs> that my paranoia carried over from where it was useful, Manhattan, to where it was pathologic, leafy old suburbia, indicates to me how powerfully home is built into our psyche. I wasn't actually preventing a burglar with those perched wine glasses. There was none. Rather, those wine glasses secured the home in my mind, the idea of home, which had been violated by my urban experience. I came and went from my boyhood home during the next four years, but ultimately returned with Donna, born in Queens, New York, to live in the city where I grew up. Perhaps a prehistoric homing instinct exists in men, different from, but no less powerful than women's so-called nesting instinct. The mythology of Odysseus, his place in our culture as an archetypal figure, one might argue, should not focus solely on his being a journeyer, quester, warrior, king, but rather on his role as the ultimate homebody, a seeker of home, a figure, a myth embodying the, yearn, the yearning for home that is, that is a fundamental aspect of humanity. Yet it is true, each day, he says to the nymph Calypso, who keeps him on her island for her own pleasure, I long for home, long for the sight of home. That I become such a suburban homebody would have appalled my 21-year-old self, a man at last heading recklessly into the world full of promise and eager for adventure. It is the irony of fate that routine, something I once so resented in my father's life, a Cleveland ad man, a suburban commuter, who today boards the same train at the same stop he first boarded in 1965, age 27, is what I cherish in my own. I had now begun to do my own work in my father's house, a free and vacant space five days a week for reasons of efficiency and quiet given the loud facts of children. It felt strange at first sitting to write in my childhood bedroom, generic by that time, no camp pennants or baseball trophies. At the desk my parents had bought for me before my entry into the sixth grade, still scarred by some incense I'd left burning there as a teenager. <laughs> when I took my midday break for exercise, I jog jogged past my elementary school each day. Halfway there, I crossed a bit of sidewalk, a cracked, sand-sewn slab that still collected water on wet days as it always did throughout my school days. The exact sidewalk stone where my classmate, Debbie Shaw, had kissed my second grader cheek for no reason. I was in love with Debbie Shaw. So that kiss marked a moment of private glory I could not help but recall each day on that run. It was as if the sidewalk slab were actually charged with some kind of memory electricity that buzzed me when I hit it. Each step of that mile and a half route I had made thousands of times in countless versions of myself, and each step of that daily jog connected me with all those versions, good and bad returning home with a shameful report card, returning home after midnight, a drunken teenager burning with love for a girl named Kathy who lived a ways beyond the school, returning home as, a, as an apprentice writer to work on a novel 
that would never be published, but that, but that would secure an agent. And still again to carry on with the books about cooking, then again with a book about a surgical team. And now this one, a book about house and home and what it might mean to live in the same place where you grew up. The structures, the physical objects of our days shape our thoughts more substantially than we often realize. A really comfortable chair makes reading better, of course, but more significant than the overt and recognized impact of structures is the fact that inanimate objects can be so influential as to seem almost animate, as if some force works through them. This too became clear to me while running. I'd gone two blocks past the Debbie Shaw sidewalk slab when it occurred to me that for the first time I hadn't thought of her. The following day, the same thing. On the third consecutive day of not thinking of her, I turned around, went back to the spot. The cracked slab where rain had gathered throughout my youth was gone, replaced by poured concrete. Debbie Shaw recedes almost out of sight. I never think of her anymore because the object, the stone that connected me to her, is gone. I loved to run along these streets because they were filled with houses that lit up in my imagination. <clears throat> Here they are not grand structures along the park boulevards, the mansions Shaker Heights is known for, nor the ones in the old neighborhoods of Cleveland Heights where Don and I once rode, fantasizing. The houses I loved to look at were middle-class colonials that truly embodied suburban culture and the life I'd known here. Some are shingled, some are brick, some are stucco, some are Tudor. No two are the same, I believe, and yet in a way they are all exactly the same. Four bedroom, two and a half bath, single family dwellings with the front lawn, a small backyard and a detached garage. Almost all of them built between 1920 and 1929. They are squeezed in tightly, some sharing a driveway as my father, father's does. They are the suburban houses of a neighborhood laid out and built along a streetcar line, which here is still referred to by name, by name that recalls its turn of the century roots, the rapid transit. These houses, in my imagination, are filled with industrial couples and busy families. I adored middle class houses, and my notion of middle-class suburban life. Workers like my father taking the rapid downtown in the morning and returning at night, the routine of the week, cutting the lawn in the summer and shoveling snow in the winter, the spaciousness and ease of the neighborhood, the start of baseball signaling the verdant spring, football the crisp and vivid fall, the suburban cocktails, the barbecues, the festive Christmas gatherings of hyperactive kids of all ages and the tipsy adults. The suburbs weren't bad. <laughs> And yet, Spernat's one's love of suburbia is not the coolest thing you can do or a surefire way to make a lot of friends at a party where you don't know anyone. Why is this so? The suburbs are where most people in the country live by choice. And yet, commentators continue to describe life in the suburbs as suffocating, homogenized, and vacuous. I'm a suburban boy raised in the suburb of a much denigrated Midwestern city during its nadir, the 1970s, now returned to it. I've never not liked the suburbs, the older ones, I mean, with old houses and old trees, cracked sidewalk slabs and irregular street patterns. And so I've always been perplexed that they should be so consistently bad now. Conformity, mediocrity, consumerism, self-homogenation happen in the suburbs, but they also happen everywhere else. Mediocrity and conformity and a reliance on consumer goods to fill the void of an insubstantial life are caused by our own choices, not a residential setup, aren't they? Don and I were about to make a permanent decision. In order to purchase this brick house in the suburbs of Cleveland, we were committing to this place. We weren't going anywhere from now on. Were we dooming ourselves? <clears throat> Historians of suburbia almost invariably quote the writer Lewis Mumford, who argued, that the building of houses constitutes the major architectural work of any civilization. Mumford was a wickedly clever commenter on suburbia in his massive book, The City and History, its history, its transformations, and its prospects, published in 1961 when he was 66 years old. He's ruthless in his contempt for suburbia, and so good a writer, he's convincing even to me. I can only shake my head and grin when I read, for instance, his conviction that the ultimate effect of the suburban landscape in our time is, ironically, a low-grade, uniform environment from which escape is impossible. Or the suburbs were, in fact, a prison, quote, a sort of green ghetto dedicated to the elite, unquote, 
creating conditions of life that result in boredom and, quote, a bland ritual of competitive spending. He is the key figure in one of suburbia's most interesting and distinguishing features, the intense intellectual disdain for the suburbs that began the moment the middle classes entered the picture in the 1920s. Anyone who reads about the subject will find two separate branches of suburban commentary, one on suburbia's physical development and another on the intellectual response to that development. That is, on the real estate itself, the suburban lot, the four-bedroom colonial with the well-tended lawn among a sea of them, and the idea of the suburb, which gives a lot of people the creeps, even though few, hardly re few really pause to think what it is or where it came from. Most people tend to think about and even write about the suburbs as being, for instance, a recent phenomenon that flowered in the 1950s. In fact, the, suburban is, the suburb is centuries, a centuries-old domestic arrangement whose death begins in the 50s. The first suburbs in the 16th and 17th centuries were in fact wretched places where the fringe members of society gathered, shanty towns, according to Robert Fishman in his book about the suburbs called Bourgeois Utopias. Most people wanted to live in cities for protection, community, and efficiency of living at a time when living was not so easy as it is now. The classes lived interspersed. The late 18th century was, of course, a revolutionary time, an age of improvement that saw create the creation of new and powerful forces, such as the novel, the steam engine, the constitution, a list that includes, Fishman says, suburbia. John Nash was the first to put all the principles of the suburb in a place in Regent's Park, an imitation of arist aristocratic luxury minus the land ownership. This was in the early 1800s. The small plots of land were owned by various families to be enjoyed by all. He created, in effect, houses in a park. America assimilated these qualities in Llewellyn Park and in Riverside, then elsewhere, about the mid-1800s. But development was relatively slow in the hundred-year-old country and would remain so until transportation pr provided the spark for explosive growth in its next major phase, the streetcar suburb, the suburb's best incarnation, the place that created the houses where I grew up and the house where I was about to move. Both houses had been built near a streetcar line. In the history of the middle-class residential suburb, writes Fishman, the late 19th century railroad suburb represents the classic form, the era in which suburbia most closely approached the bourgeois monument and the bourgeois utopia. It exemplified the central meaning and contradiction of suburbia, a natural world of greenery and family life that appeared to be wholly separate from the great city, yet was, in fact, wholly dependent on it. Criticism focused on the suburb, however, is usually not, in fact, criticism of suburbs. Its real target is the middle class mentality and describes an intellectual disdain for the tastes of the masses. Attacking suburbia has been a convenient way to explain all kinds of societal problems, notes Kenneth Jackson in Crabgrass Frontier. The culture at large, many have noted, has even spun once neutral descriptions of suburban culture into terms of derogation, housewife, homely, homemaker, or has personified entire lives with a cliché such as the soccer mom. Jackson calls suburbia the quintessential physical achievement of the United States. It is perhaps more representative of its culture than big cars, tall buildings, or professional football. Suburbia symbolizes the fullest, most unadulterated embodiment of contemporary culture. It is a manifestation of such fundamental characteristics of American society, society as conspicuous consumption, a reliance upon the private automobile, upward mobility, the separation of the family into nuclear units, the widening division between work and leisure, and a tendency toward racial and economic exclusiveness. Even Baxendahl and Ewan, two researchers writing recently, conclude, even though most Americans now live in suburbs, snobbery towards suburbia and its inhabitants continues. Yet suburbia was a communal, commercial response to a long-standing social need, housing for a third of the nation. People moved to the suburbs because it was their, in their best financial, it was their best financial option. Some found it isolating, others found it rich in possibilities. None found it to be a changeless never-never land. From the beginning, it has been riven by conflict, and so it continues to be. 
That mirrored my understanding of the suburbs, that life there might be a richly textured world of struggle and love and loss, the small triumphs, tragedies, and great possibilities that compose most people's lives. By the 1970s, the decade that marks the end of the suburb, more Americans lived in a suburb than anywhere else. Having been born into the end of the suburban era, perhaps I'm writing in a sentimental effort to pre preserve in memory what was all but dead by the time I left it in 1981. The suburbia that formed the terrain of my childhood was shadowy in summer from maples that flourished there, its winters filled with, snow, with, with storms and chest-high snows. We never thought about personal safety because we didn't have to, didn't lock our house during the day when all were gone. From age five, I walked nearly a mile to school with my five-year-old pal, Clay, and home again, our parents scarcely giving it a thought, apparently. While suburbia was not to be replaced, and new residences that went up became a facet of sprawl, endless exurbias connected only by the interstate, their houses connected by the internet. Many suburbs would remain thriving places because the houses built there decades ago were so fine and durable. The houses preserved what was best. The fact of the houses themselves, the structures, was what made these places last, even though the families in them didn't, even though Americans continued to move from place to place. The design of the houses was classical in nature, and so their appearance continued to be appealing. Solid construction of beautiful houses ensured that people would take care of them. Don and I were among those people and were eager to accept the risks involved. The place we had chosen, and it's in the Euclid Heights allotment, which is sort of uh, bound by uh, Coventry, Euclid Heights Boulevard, you know, uh, Mayfield, and, um, and Cedar, kind of a triangle in there below, uh, west of Coventry. Um, uh, very old and begun in about 19, planned out in 1892, are the first uh, street maps planned out there. The place we had chosen, created many decades ago, had like, had like the house, a scale of its own. How big were the houses? How close together? What was the neighborhood's population? How dense? How wide were the streets? How far from the commercial centers were the residences? How far from the city center? How far from the highway? The answers to these questions describe the nature of the place. Houses here were spread out, set back on deep lawns divided by a broad street, the spaces between rooming. This house had been created in the heyday of public transportation. Its streets were drawn on maps before cars were invented. Not only were the streets formed around a streetcar line, a line that uh, eventually went up Euclid Heights Boulevard to Coventry, uh, but commercial districts were built within walking distance. Here, Donna had been prescient in what she demanded from a house. I want to be able to walk places, she said. We wanted a street where the kids could run around, without, run around without, without our feeling the urge to check on them every five minutes. A street that was pleasant to walk along. Donna especially wanted a house near some sort of town center. And we had two, both built before the Depression, rows of two-story buildings that could accommodate a shop at ground level and an apartment above, a design now typically outlawed by zoning laws separating residences and business. We could actually walk to the grocery store, to the library, to the video store, to three playgrounds, to an ice cream parlor, to a half dozen nice restaurants or a half dozen chain restaurants. Every route defined by wide sandstone sidewalks, tall trees, and houses of diverse, intriguing styles. This was part of a house's scale as well. It had to be the right size house in the right size community. We didn't want to have to drive 20 minutes for milk nor did we want the store directly across the street. This ability to walk to virtually all the places we could need in our daily life, the only service not within walking distance, was a post office, is a circumstance that's almost unheard of in contemporary American suburbia. Unheard of, at least in part, because it's unnecessary. We drive everywhere. As others have noted, America is now scaled for cars, not humans. For humans, America is out of scale. We too would continue to drive to the grocery store even though we could walk to avoid lugging all those groceries home on foot. But the option to walk to get an ice cream cone with the kids on a summer evening or to get some new books at the library, Donna knew, was fundamental to her ideal home. 
And of course, every now and then, we wanted a Walmart. But these places and every place we needed was a quick drive away. The grocery store, the post office, Home Depot, and Walmart, and Donna's lab, many of them could be found in the same gigantic expanse of blacktop and concrete. Modern monstrosities of convenience, bearable to me because of the convenience and because of the convenience and the fact that I didn't work there. You could get your errands done in those soulless places efficiently and return to the soulful quiet of your house beneath shady maples and oaks. Donna couldn't articulate it, but being able to walk places she believed was more than just a pleasant benefit. It connected you to something bigger, something nourishing. The idea of living in a McMansion suburb, on the other hand, was like living in a bubble. They didn't even make sidewalks anymore because people no longer walked. This was page one news in USA Today in our neighboring county, Geauga, Geauga was page one new, <coughs> excuse me, was picked out as an example, the quintessence of suburban sprawl containing, not coincidentally, more fatties than anywhere in America. <laughs> when there was nowhere to walk to and nothing to walk on, you were cut off from your neighbors in your neighborhood. Our neighborhood in Cleveland Heights had been shaped on a scale relative to foot traffic and the electric streetcar. We didn't think deeply about this at the time. Donna simply insisted, I want to be able to walk places, and I felt the same way. In a book called How Cities Work, journalist Alex Marshall describes how spaces become places. The three main forces that determine the nature of a place in America are transportation, the exchange of money and politics, and the most powerful <clears throat> the exchange of money and politics, excuse me. And the most important and powerful of those by far is transportation. When the car supplanted public transportation, it changed the way we shape the space that this country has in such abundance. And the shape of a place, in turn, shapes the way we interact with one another and within a community. We're separ we've separated ourselves from each other almost absolutely. We have cut off commerce from community. Bookstars are dying because we can buy books and CDs and DVDs from Amazon without leaving the house. We can buy nearly anything at all on eBay and have it delivered to our doorstep. It doesn't get more convenient than that. We do our daily shopping at big superstores surrounded by big parking lots. Community is based on foot traffic, but in subdivisions with no sidewalks, we have houses but not communities. Who needs sidewalks? There's nothing to walk to. You've got to drive. For exercise, you order a Stairmaster and do your walking in place, going nowhere. How we get around, Marshall writes, determines how we live. Different transportation systems produce different types of cities. This dynamic is almost impossible to change. It was not until the introduction of the raised, limited access freeway after World War II, he continues, that the era of place, of urbanity in cities was truly swept away. An interstate highway is in incompatible with any form of street-based activity. This post-war invention swept away streets and the need for them. We enter a world, world of pods placed off freeway ramps, the pods ranging from subdivisions to shopping malls and office parks. Among the many actual and figurative deaths brought about by these highways is the death of community. That, <clears throat> the way we've shaped our place has, in fact, given us isolated, fragmented lives. We are liberated by the car and the internet. We own a series of increasingly larger homes with bigger bathrooms and swanker kitchens, but we don't know our neighbors. And this, writes Marshall, is a brutal situation. I speak without any sentimentality or nostalgia for the past, he says, because I believe, however, that the generally fragmented lives so many of us lead break up marriages, disturb childhoods, isolate people when they most need help, and make life not as much fun. In the book, Marshall talks about where he lives, in Norfolk, Virginia, the place where he was born, with his wife, also born there. Here was a writer who was doing exactly what I was doing, actively choosing to remain in the city where he grew up, even though it wasn't a cosmopolitan center of energy and ideas. It wasn't New York City, that is, where a writer and journalist, able to hobnob with editors and agents and prominent colleagues, might advance his career to the fullest. He was doing his work from his hometown because he could, because he could. He valued this choice and advocated it to others. He was a kindred spirit. It's no wonder, I suppose, that I found his voice to be elegant and straightforward, his blend of personal convictions and objective reportage well-balanced, 
He lived in a good city where he could get places on foot and knew who he was. Given his dire descriptions of place in America, given his dire descriptions of place in America, though, I should probably cast a wary glance at that convenient, soul-killing Home Depot Walmart complex that I was so happy to have near me. But all grim forecasts about the way American, America was changing, changing aside, there seemed little for us personally to worry about. We were lucky. Our house and our place had been formed before the car and the highway took over as the determiners of place, and it was not likely to change because the houses themselves were valuable and cared for. Ours was being cared for in a very expensive way, but soon that would end. Soon the shell below would fill with usable rooms. We were on a street where we could walk everywhere we needed routinely or simply take a walk for some fresh air. We could do our work in our house and we could relax after work in our house. The structure facilitating all the things we cared about. Soon it would be the perfect house. I'm going to read one more short bit, if that's OK. And then I'll uh, take some questions if anybody wants to talk. What, most of what I've written in books has focused on men who labor with their hands, all of whom are guided by the work of their predecessors. This point is especially salient for me in the work of the chef, the fundamental techniques a chef uses, those most basic tenets of his or her work, such as stock and sauce making, braising tough meats or sautéing tender ones, rely on principles of heat and cold that have existed since humankind first realized many thousands of years ago that heat changed the texture and flavor of food. Their work is daily informed by the work of French chefs of several centuries before them, from La Varenne to Carême to Escoffier. I was fortunate enough to meet work with and write about one of the country's lionized American chefs, Thomas Keller, as watchful a craftsman as I have met. And he liked to say that if you are a really good cook, you could travel back in time and be at home in any kitchen because the food and cooking work today as they always have. When you braise, braise tough meat, it is today as it always has been. Brown at first in hot fat, then cooked gently in liquid. But what his observation meant to me was that because cooking relied on the same processes now as ever, because a cook in the 17th century was feeling and smelling and seeing the same things when he braised, say, oxtail, as I did when I braised oxtail, and if I paid attention to the process, enjoyed the sizzle of the aroma of floured meat hitting the fat, keeping watch over the cooking of a deepening stew, I connected in a way with that 7th century 17th century cook. I connected to all those people who had done, done exactly what I was doing, I affirmed my own humanity by making stew. This was part of the great pleasure and profound satisfaction of cooking, this connection. If you eat a great classic dish all your life, onion soup for instance, the experience can become almost ritualistic. Part of the pleasures of eating a good bowl of onion soup, Keller asserted, is that you connect to all those onion soups you have ever eaten. He's right. The idea of onion soup is a reference point against which you measure each actual one. And all your experiences with onion soup, from the 70s sludge in a crock, to the one you would watch your wife eat in the hotel room on your honeymoon, to the ethereal one you found in a country inn by yourself on a cold fall day, those onion soup experiences accumulate and become a part of a timeline of onion soup experiences that grows richer with each successive one. A great big connect the dots picture, a mystery until the end. This is partly the reason we enjoy returning to some foods over and over again. The point in bringing up this onion soup business is to suggest that to be engaged in the continuum of a house is not ultimately what's so important to me, though that alone is a great good fortune. It is to be in the same house for a long time in the city where I was born. For me, it paves the way toward the ultimate connection to God or the life force, or whatever you want to call the overmastering order maker in an otherwise chaotic universe. To tread daily the same paths as I, I did as a child, to school and then home, to friends' homes, then back to mine, this is important. When I worked at my father's house while Donna worked on, on our house, I ran at midday. That work in my old house, that daily run, staked me to my history, to all my former selves. And the same connective onion soup powers rise out of the routines of home, 
mowing the lawn, the route to the grocery store, the smell of the kitchen when no one is cooking, the sense of every day, experience without thought or reflection, but powerfully absorbed. It will be the same routine my children absorb, and they may need to resent me for my routine as I needed to resent my father his. My daughter and son might even play baseball in the same fields I played on. The thought of that recalls the passion with which I lived for those ball games. My passion for baseball then exceeds in intensity most passions I feel now in flabby middle age for anything. Not to mention the onrushing new and raw sensations of anguish and joy over girls who are now moms I still know. A love of home is ultimately a connection with the life circle, no different from the seasons. To live here is to engage in the continuum of my father's life, leading to mine, leading to my children's. And this obviates what might otherwise be our biggest fear, fear of death, ceasing to exist. A recognition of this continuum and a deliberate effort to observe it makes any such regret or worry about death or the apparent lack of meaning in life it makes all that inappropriate. It gives a sense of life integrity to each day and to each day's prosaic routines. It's important to roast a chicken once a week or make your mom's pasta that you ate throughout your childhood or braise short ribs if you pay attention. It was likewise important to me now to be scraping dark mortar into the spaces between the bricks of my house. I was not doomed, like my friend Clay, to stop in a neighborhood and no longer mine, to stare through a rental car window at a house at his lost time. I'm sure he enjoys the experience of gazing. Um, <clears throat> I live, excuse me, I live there still. Clay probably wouldn't choose the word doomed. I'm sure he enjoys the experience of gazing. It's something we do. Not long ago, when Donna visited her dad on Long Island, he picked her up at LaGuardia, and instead of heading north, he returned to gaze with his daughter and grandchildren at the house his father had built on 169th Street in Flushing, Queens, off 45th Avenue. It was happy and sad at the same time. Nostalgia is as close as we can get, I think. I'm, I'm losing my track here. I'm thinking about this. This means so much to me. Sorry. Um, it was happy and sad at the same time for Donna and her father. Do we have a word that means happy and sad at the same time? Nostalgia is as close as we can get, I think, but that word is diminished almost beyond meaning now. Return pain, perhaps. Maybe home pain, since home retains its warmer connotation, connotations, ease and gladness. These are the sentiments that have always been a part of me, naturally and insistently. Clay and I would slip through the sliding screen door to the lowest floor of his grandmother's house in damp sweatsuits at five years old to steal another ice cream sandwich. It was a kind of elegant rec room with a player piano. We continually ran the song Those Were the Days by Mary Hopkin. We sang and danced to it. I remember sensing the irony of this. I recognized then that these were, the, these were those days and I knew then that they wouldn't last. I tried to tell Clay this, was unable to articulate it, though I knew he sensed it too. Neither of us understood what irony was, of course. Now I found the song embarrassingly simplistic and mawkish, but the pathos was somehow immediately and richly accessible to a five-year-old, and so we danced, and I was even then happy sad, until we returned to our imaginary games in the pool, in the sun, and felt infinitely happy again. I called my first novel Away Home, which were the best words of the whole unpublishable lot. I liked the double meaning you could read into it. A way home, the, sim the simultaneous desire to flee and to return. I could choose to be still, caught between both, or I could choose one, a way home or a way home. And homeward it was. To stay home had a velocity all its own. It haunted me. Returning to the streets that I grew up on, to be forever surrounded by the weather that was part of my sycamore heart, the smells of the leaves and the grass and the rain on its sandstone sidewalks, was not only the key to the practical comforts that made daily work fruitful and life fun, a good house in a neighborhood with a lot of kids, but was in fact, a fundament, was in fact fundamental to a deep spiritual connectedness, a sense of immortality. This truly was why I was only now coming to fully understand I had to return to Cleveland. 
like a salmon returning to spawn, like eels of the Saragasso Sea fluttering back to the brackish waters of Maine and Brittany, I was just more wildlife acting on instinct. The intention to live where I was born was not something I ignored or explained away, but rather embraced. To return to these streets, to me, in this way, felt majestic, a fantastic victory. Okay, gotcha, I will do that. First, I'd like to thank a few people who are here. There, there are uh, other people who are sort of fanatic about structure, as I, Craig Bobby, back in the back row, was extremely helpful in helping me locate the history of a house and when it was built, because we couldn't find out why Bilbero, Kara, uh, Hugh and Deanna are, are, are famous for uh, discovering their, their neighborhood. Uh, it's a really rich place, and I feel fortunate to be in a place where so many interesting people interested in these uh, ordinary, so-called ordinary structures. So um, I thank all of you guys um, for your help um, and your work.